are back now from a seven and a half minute break, which I think expanded a little bit. Um, but here we are. And um, we're going to have, uh, we usually have our legislative attorneys walk us through bills, but um, we had scheduled this one and there was some conflict with Ameren. So um, Senator Rom Hinsdale is the sponsor of this bill. And so we're going to ask her, which is very unusual, but we're going to ask her to just give us a sense of what it is and and then we'll take it up more thoroughly later. Yes, sounds okay. good. And so for the record, Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale, I am not an attorney. I do not play one on TV, um, but I um, do feel like I gained some legal knowledge of this issue when I was the uh, community liaison in Burlington's Community and Economic Development Office. We drafted a language access plan for Burlington, and I spent a lot of time in the city attorney's office discussing what the implications are for creating that. Um, it would help me to share my screen just because then I can see you all. Sure. Okay, great. Um, how they do it, they make it look so easy. But um, mm -hmm. just uh, wanted to share S-147 um, in an act relating to language access plans. The only other context that, that I would give before we start is that there are a lot of states where a large city or municipality or a department of the state have a language access plan. It's a current wave of states kind of coordinating across language access plans and maybe having one overarching language access plan. And the states that are more likely developing language access plans at the state level are smaller states, you know, where their whole state government might fit into one really large state department or, you know, New York City, where we don't compete in terms of the size of their government. So, um, you know, that that's where you see language access plans. The only other thing I would say is that um, the urgency of this became really apparent to me in the pandemic, and I hope it became apparent to some of you. Um, and it, it's definitely, uh, became apparent to others in state government and emergency services and in the general public. Uh, when the pandemic first started, there was a volunteer interpretation effort that started up so that videos about washing hands, public safety, and school closures, et cetera, could get out into the community in people's own languages. We have several popular languages in the state that do not have a written equivalent. So Mai Mai, for example, that's so spoken by the Somali Bantu population is a spoken language only. Um, so you need to really understand each language and the combination of needs of written materials, videos, um, trusted sources of information, translating things culturally and not just in terms of the actual words as, as uh, you know, Virginie Diambu would point out at, at CBOEO, um, there's no, equivalent word for weatherization. You know, you really have to ah. sort of think about that one. So, you know, you language access plans require you to do some of that thinking in advance. So with that said, more as in my, with my lead sponsor hat on and now with, you know, more of a, of a legal lens to this, um, this would add to, this would add um, a section one, chapter 69 to uh, require ling greater language access in the state. Um, the first section is on translating materials, explaining agency services. So that's where we talked about a little bit about the difference between translation, which is is the, is defined as a more direct word for word description of what you're doing. Interpretation really opens you up to recognizing that as someone gives you a full sentence and you say it as best you can in the other language, that's an interpretation of the information. It's not a direct translation. Um, but this asks that every state agency that serves a substantial number of non-English speaking individuals provide its critical materials explaining ser its services um, in non-English languages commonly spoken. Um, the definition of a non-English speaking individual is one that has limited English proficiency. That has its own definition, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, hopefully it's a bit obvious to people and, and Amarin could go into that further before, um, after. Um, this is a really key piece that will come back, which discusses what should be considered a priority document to interpret or translate, um, I should say, because if you have thousands of forms you have, let's say, um, you know, then there are cases in civil rights law that 
make it clear the the sort of decisions there made it clear that the most important things that get highest priority if you have limited resources are things that inform an individual of their legal rights, duties, or privileges, um, and information that's life saving. Uh, so you know those become critical agencies to have go first, right? Like public safety and health, you know, over things like parks and rec, which is really nice to have. And, and those are often the departments that have extra money to do stuff like that. But you need to make sure that the ones that are life-saving and critical to participation um, go first. Um, this, this is a lot about notice of having those translated materials available. Um, this is about encouraging local offices to have material available. And I would say as some may know, municipalities really felt the need to, to be supported in this way. You, if you have state forms that can help municipalities, it's really helpful. If the municipality knows from the state, oh, these languages are commonly spoken in your area, that would really help. And that information was kind of slow to get across during the pandemic. And the only other thing I would say about the pandemic is in some ways, as horrific as it has been, we're more fortunate that it is a slow moving disaster. If this was a quickly moving disaster um, and you needed to get life-saving information because of a chemical spill or a flood to people, we were not well equipped to do that at all in other languages and probably as well in certain um, you know, uh, ways for in the ADA compliance world, you know, ASL, et cetera. I don't know to be sure, but certainly with uh, spoken languages, we were not. Um, this again just sort of um, talks about the prioritization of high populations, certain populations that speak a language, um, and that it be uh, tied to their rights, duties, or privileges, that those are important. Um, this one's a critical piece on how the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Health, the ones I mentioned that are pretty life saving, um, shall maintain contracts with uh, organizations within the state for translation and interpretation services needed for all hazards events. So that's kind of what I was just explaining. That feels like a really critical piece to get right first. Um, and there's a reason we talk about organizations within the state. There's different, there's, there's sort of best practices that go back and forth. Um, if you are talking about someone's one-on-one -on -one casework, sometimes it can be tricky to use an organization within the state. There may be only two people who speak that language that are on call and that may feel really um, exposing for that person to know that there, there's someone who's he hearing or seeing their information that's within their community. Um, so then you might wanna get someone else on the phone. When you're talking about explaining general information to people, it's generally better to have the organization be within the state because there's, again, a lot of that cultural translation. You wanna make sure they understand the context of our state as they try to get this information more clearly to people um, you know, who speak other languages. This is then more of the backstop requirement that there be language access plans within each state agency, um, that they uh, work as hard as they can to build a language access plan that, uh, that it explains how they're serving non-English speaking individuals. Um, it's filed with the agency of administration and it's reviewed and revised at least once every five years. Probably should do it um, you know, given the way that our refugee resettlement programs work and we take very different populations every year, probably should be done more than once every five years, but that was a starting point. Um, and the requirements for that language access plan um, shall ensure meaningful access to services, including a list of translated documents and languages into which those documents are translated, interpretation services that are on contract. Most agencies now in the state have a contract service probably helps if we know which ones those are. So we know if there's duplication or we're, you know, we start to use one contract and um, that kind of thing. Total number of staff with language access skills and the ability to provide interpretation services, a language access training plan. So how, when someone calls and doesn't speak English, knowing exactly what to do when that happens or walks through your door at the DMV, let's say, um, a monitoring plan, outreach strategies, and any additional information the agency of administration might want to include. Um, this should also include monitoring and reporting complaints around language access. Um, it, it, this, this gets to some best practices as well. Um, it's not a best practice to have an individual's family or acquaintance um, provide the interpretation instead of a qualified interpreter. They could be interpreting legal information, life-saving information. It could be a child interpreting for a parent. That is never a best practice. And unfortunately, we see that a lot in situations 
where they can't figure out how to get an interpreter available. Um, okay, okay. Senator Ram Hizo, may I ask a question here? Yeah, sorry, I'm moving really fast. Yeah. No, this is this is great. Um, are there, I know, um, for example, with ASL, mm -hmm. that um, there are uh, professional and licensed interpreters, yeah. but I'm thinking about all the different languages like um, that are spoken in different communities. Are there professional interpreters for those languages or, or could the a department contract with somebody who would be considered a, a, a safe person, even if they're not a professional interpreter? I mean, I certainly ran into, into that when I worked at a domestic violence agency and someone would say, this is the only person I trust. At the same time, there's a lot of best practices around making sure that's mm -hmm. the person they really trust and it's safe. And they're not just saying that because they're afraid that it would cost them money or mm -hmm. that you know, they're afraid to say something else. So it's, it's, it's generally just not a best practice ever to use someone who walks in the door with that person. Also, there's different levels of certification depending on the kind of information you're interpreting. Court information is very different than permitting information. Yeah. Very, you know, it's very different than medical information. So you really, you know, want to make sure that that person has certification in that particular language, in that um, particular field. Field. So there's modules that people can go through for that. And do we have those people in Vermont? Yes, we do. And okay. you know, one of the the one of the reasons to talk about contracting with a specific group is to give them a retainer contract that's more. Yeah. You can't just say, oh my gosh, we're having a flood, get me a my, my interpreter on the phone, right? You know, you have to sort of have that person retained and mm -hmm. the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and USCRI, they have interpreters, but it's really hard for them to keep that consistent. You know, if all of a sudden they get a big contract and then they don't have a big contract, et cetera. So, you know, the state being a consistent contractor is, is helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, so then there's a process that they, they have to have a way that you can file a complaint if you didn't receive a uh, significant st strong language access um, steps the agency is taking to improve language access is if they receive complaints or just through their evaluation process. Um, the, the state's emergency plan and how they're communicating life safety information and disaster relief materials specifically to non English speaking Vermonters. Um, and just regular evaluation and monitoring of the composition of these populations, kind of what we were talking about, making sure you know more regularly who we're talking about and the kinds of needs that they have. It, even depending on age, you could need slightly different information or support, could be gender-based. You just really want to know um, what the cultural needs are of the populations that you're serving as well. Um, the So... This is, again, agencies uh, furnishing these reports um, to the Secretary of Administration and um, outlining the number of qualified bilingual employees needed or the contract employees and interpreters needed. Um, this obviously has dates that are now in the past, but this is sort of to say right away, this is the, we need to do an evaluation and kind of an assessment of where we are or are not with um, the gaps and unmet needs or the populations that are seeking service. Um, and this has the chief performance officer um, determining the application of this to each state agency in consultation with regional planning commissions um, and appointing authorities. And I should say, Susanna Davis has been very interested in this. Um, we talked a little bit before session about, you know, what language might be helpful or sort of get in the way of what she's trying to do. So I'm very open to her feedback. We just haven't talked about this in a couple months. Um, and the chief performance officer needs to consider the number of individuals served by the agency, the number of non-English speaking individuals served by the agency as a proportion, um, the frequency by which they are served, uh, the, the language minority populations that are eligible for the agency's programs or activities, um, but may be underserved because of language barriers and the extent to which information or services rendered by the agency constitute life-saving um, services or information that affects their legal rights, privileges, or duties. So that's the CPO basically coming in and saying, with limited resources, we get that you want to you want to interpret everything, you know, translate everything, um, but the resources that are limited right now need to go to public safety and health, for example, first, that kind of thing. Um, 
these evaluations need to be um, filed it with uh, the state and the chief performance officer needs to evaluate the sufficiency of translation and interpretation services. Um, and they shall submit a report to the House and Senate committees on government operations appropriations because this, um, you know, UVM Medical spends millions of dollars on interpretation. You know, you, when you do it right, it is expensive and you need to understand that at a budgetary level. Um, and judiciary, it's a civil rights issue, but I can't remember exactly why we put judiciary in, but um, we, we can talk more about that um, with recommendations on increasing or maintaining a sufficient level of translation and interpretation. And the chief performance officer, officer shall take into account federal requirements, guidance for interpretation, recommendations from groups in the state um, that are more interactive with non-English speaking individuals um, and recommendations on the use of videos to, to help with life-saving services and legal rights, privileges, or duties. So again, just a nod to the languages that don't, that are better graphically, um, where they don't have as strong of a written form. Um, and the, the CPO shall note where the agency is not meeting federal uh, requirements for public participation under the Civil Rights Act. Um, this is the last piece that really just speaks to emergency management needing to do this you know, now, <laughs> um, you know, before there is a disaster or some kind of emergency that really, um, you know, leads to a, a safety hazard. Erica Borneman and I talked about this last session and it's something it's really important to her. For example, you know, we talked about how we have a, an alert system with Everbridge where you can sign up for alerts around the state on things happening in your municipality. Didn't have great information on the pandemic, unfortunately, it's a lot about a water main breaking or traffic on, you know, particular route. Um, we talked about having more emergency information through that system and being able to click to have it in other languages. That's one thing. And she was happy to do that right away because places like New York and LA obviously have that with very similar vendors. Um, but there's a whole nother layer you could go like having WhatsApp broadcast channels is a very popular way to speak to people quickly as a trusted government channel um, so that they get the information quickly. It doesn't, we don't need to write in statute, use WhatsApp, but WhatsApp, for example, is a very important way that most people are used to getting government information in other countries um, quickly. Um, this has an effective date still in the future, but yeah, some of the dates in here are not quite in the future. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was that was helpful. Um, and uh, really, what we're, my yes. meeting, got, my joint rules meeting got canceled. Oh, perfect. So, what we're really talking about here is requiring state agencies to have a language access plan addressing all of these particular issues. We're not telling them we're not designing the plan for them. We're telling them that they need to have a plan and we need to start with those three places like um, public safety, um, health and emergency management, which is part of public safety. Right, and, and your legal rights and duties. So like yeah. most, most of a and doesn't fall before public safety, but what if you get fined or thrown in jail because you didn't know about a hunting regulation or you didn't know about, you know, a permitting process that you missed, you know, you, we have a burden to give that information so people can meet their rights and duties in the state, their tax burdens, et cetera. You know, you, you have to information in other languages. You know, I know this isn't language, but the Vermont Bar Association has put out a, a little pamphlet that says now you're 18 or something like that. And it, it's all the rights and responsibilities and duties you have once you turn 18. And that's the kind of thing <laughs> that would be, um, here are your, here's what you do when, when this happens. Exactly. I mean, yeah. a lot of communities are departing upwards, right? Like when you see <laughs> got a grant from um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston that they weren't able to use yet because of the pandemic, but it was to take new arrivals on buses around to meet at the library and the police department and understand civic um, centers of life and where you have your rights and responsibilities. Like, so you feel you really understand government. Um, it, the, what you said also reminds me, what this often does is make 
agencies put things in plain English first before they put them in other languages, which helps people who speak English. Um, often, anytime you say, none of this makes any sense in another language, you simplify it in a way that often benefits people who speak English as well. I was going to say this, a similar comment about having, um, I know a lot of Vermonters that should go on that bus tour. <laughs> <laughs> I often find with, you know, these kinds of equity related issues, you help everyone when you think about a specific population that is learning something culturally for the first time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I actually think this is also a great jobs creation bill because it will attract more translators and more people with language skills to Vermont to live, work and do this work, which would be great. Yeah. Yeah. It's often an undercompensated skill as well. We'll use yeah. the 16 year old kid, you know, which is not a good practice and you can hire someone and, and actually compensate them instead. Asia, I'm, I'm wondering what, you know, it says a substantial number of non-English speaking yeah. people, but I'm just wondering who, who would determine not, you know, you could, it could be a sticky question for some people who just say, well, it's not substantial enough for us to deal with it. That's just wondering what your thoughts are on that. That's a great question and one I think we need to really dig into with some legal experts on this topic. My understanding was always that the threshold, there is zero, there's almost zero threshold for requiring verbal interpretation. If someone needs to pay their taxes and they call the tax department and they say, I don't speak English and you know, or they, you get that sense, they need to have a, a hotline that they can call a contracted service. Usually that has people all over the country available any time of day or night. Um, mostly during the day though, that you can call them and say, I need a my, my interpreter right now. And they will get someone on the line somewhere in the country. Those services are used right now by our state and local municipalities. Um, and we can go into detail with them on what those contracts look like. When you talk about the requirement to have a, translate, uh, a translated document, a translated written document, the federal threshold is that there are 5% 5% of that population in the county speaks that language. Um, we There's very few places where we meet that threshold in Vermont. Probably my guess would be maybe um, Mai Mai, Somali Bantu French and, um, and Bhutanese Nepali in Chittenden County. But even there, I don't know if it gets to 5%. Um, and so, you know, you, you want to just start to look at maybe the top five to 10 languages that are spoken um, in that area and, and rely on those. Um, the other thing to keep in mind in Vermont and elsewhere in the country is we have a big population of people that may not be counted in the census that speak Spanish. Um, and so Spanish is always a pretty good language to do even if it doesn't show up in the census. Um, so substantial, I believe Amarin could probably come in and talk about whether or not that has kind of a definition that's been worked out between court cases and you know Civil Rights Act compliance. Um, <laughs> There are certain Civil Rights Act standards, and then there are best practices. And you know, often knowing the top ten languages spoken in an area or requested when you you contact a certain agency are important. Um, I will say one of the most specific languages that people often reach out to me and say they're having trouble with is Mandarin Chinese. Um, we it's a very specific language, and if you don't get it right, you can't just sort of make it up as you go. And there's no there's not a lot of equivalence and. We have had people like the one Mandarin interpreter in the state left and he reached out to me and said, I'm just really worried <laughs> because I'm moving out of the state and I don't know what's going to happen. So, um, you know, that that's just an anecdotal example. Oh, my niece is a Mandarin speaker. She spent a lot of time in China and she now works for a, a think tank or for the State Department. Um, <laughs> Maybe we can call her. Maybe we could get her to move to Vermont and be a Mandarin interpreter. Yeah, it would be I, great. Might, you know, I think you might be expressing a conflict of interest or something there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. What, what does that, when they call that hotline, Keisha, do we know what they charge a state or an agency for that? For that? That's a great question. I mean, it's become pretty standard depending on the level of intensity and how hard it is to find that language. Um, but that's a great question. You know. Burlington's asked all the time, how much are you spending on interpretive services? I just don't have the itemized breakdown. And then, for example, at AALV, um, Association of Africans Living in Vermont Elsewhere, they might charge anywhere from $60 to $120 an hour, um, depending on, you know, who they can get and how, it could. what if you're interpreting for one person versus a whole group of people 
that kind of thing. So, you know, we might, oh, go ahead, Allison. No, no. So we can add to this that this is a job creation bill and a good paying <laughs> job creation bill. Pretty so we should thing. go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, you develop a lot of skills by doing this job, right? You know, and getting the training. And so it's a very high skilled job to be able to interpret quickly in a public meeting, that kind of thing. Hence, as you may know, ASL interpreters, it's pretty much $100 and above is pretty standard as well. Which is why we can't rely on that, um, the whatever you call that on right, the bottom the of our screens that does the translating because it is really bad. But yeah. um, so I had another um, question that I was going to ask you. Oh, we, we should talk, the judiciary, I think, has a pretty good, um, from what I understand, uh, translation service, and I don't know how they do it, but we should have them come in and talk to, them, to us about how they, how they do that, because that could be yeah. some kind of model for some of the agencies. And they're always improving, right? They're specific best practices for court. When I used to go to court, they would use the same interpreter for the defendant and the plaintiff. That is not a best practice, right? That is not a good idea um, because that person is also just helping people culturally understand what's happening in court. And that puts them in a, in a very difficult position. I imagine in Chittenden County, they've sorted that out. I don't know if all over the state they're following the best practice or not for financial reasons and other reasons, but it's, you know, each agency or division or sort of segment of government has very specific best practices that it should be following. Well, it Actually, um, providing those services now would, will be, I would assume, easier than 10 or 15 years ago because we have technology that allows us to, so if you have an interpreter in Burlington and you have two people in Brattleboro who speak that right. language, you don't need an interpreter in Brattleboro, but through technology, the court or the agency or whoever could, yeah, improving all the time that technology absolutely yeah any other questions for Keisha no, that, that was very helpful to me sure. I would like I, I, I hope we uh, we do this I, I think this is uh, it fits a lot of our other work and supports a lot of our other work and uh, I would look forward to moving this forward I think um, <clears throat> particularly your uh, introduction about kind of framing it was was helpful because I didn't understand a lot of that. Um, I mean, I don't. And so I, I live in this little bubble where um, some of us have a hard time speaking English, but that's not because we have a different native language. It's because we're just we don't pay a lot of attention to the language, but yeah, that was very helpful. Good. There's been a lot of learning through failure, right? I mean, I'm not picking on anyone in particular. Having worked in the city of Burlington, we got it wrong a lot. Burlington and Winooski have learned a lot of hard about how to do this right. For example, if someone is, is Somali, speaks Somali Somali and someone is Somali Bantu, so, so someone is ethnically Somali Somali, someone's ethnically Somali Bantu, um, the person who's Somali Somali speaks Somali, the person who's Somali Bantu speaks Mai Mai. There's, there's a past conflict there that if you have someone who's, uh, who's speaking, who's Somali Somali speaking to someone who's Somali Bantu, they could be incredibly afraid or just uncomfortable in that interaction. And you would never know as a person who's not part of the cultural conflict that has brought them here to this country. So we learned a lot by failing and getting this wrong um, and just hoping that the state learns before, you know, it's too late. So I have a, I mean, I, I think that one of the questions is going to be resources. And I know in the governor's state of the state yesterday, he talked a lot about um, welcoming refugees here. And I wonder if he would be willing to put some of that, uh, some of those resources behind something like this to help in to um, help him with his goal of bringing more refugees here. It's a very basic step. I mean, imagine, you know, folks may remember we passed a bill I had put forward last year for cultural liaisons that would be shared between <laughs> localities and school districts. 
in the height of the pandemic last summer, many people in some of those communities had no interpreter that was reaching out to them because that person had been paid by the school and they weren't available to them in the summer. They had very little information about how to be safe, how to get anything. And if you can imagine, you don't feel very welcome here if you literally are in a pandemic with no information in your language. It was very scary for a lot of people. And, you know, it's something we can only slightly imagine and appreciate. So, you know, I, I hope the governor would would see the need for this is also a civil rights issue. And um, it's it helps people survive disasters that are quickly moving as well. I so. think one of the pushbacks is going to be that <clears throat> if people are living here, they should learn to speak English. And I think that that is an okay um, argument that because most people will eventually learn to speak English just because their children are in school and so their children come home. And my both sets of my grandparents came from Norway and Sweden and didn't speak a word of English at all, but gradually learned to speak English. But um, and the only thing that saved them was because it was a <clears throat> hundred years ago and it was very rural where they moved and everybody else that lived there also spoke Norwegian or Swedish. So <clears throat> um, I, I think that that is going to be a question that some people have about why, why we need to put all these resources into helping people who don't speak English instead of helping them to learn English. And I think we need to do both. Absolutely. I mean, you really, you really hit the nail on the head with talking about your grandparents. At some point, there's like a plasticity of the brain. And a lot of times with limited English proficiency, we're talking about elders. We're talking about people who get even more isolated because they don't know how to get on the bus. They don't know, you know, how to, how to call for help. Um, they can be taken advantage of. We talk about elder exploitation a lot. They can be taken advantage of even more. You know, I, I don't want to cast any blame, I mean, by using this example, but we know kids can be kids. And if your child speaks better English than you do, and they say, you know, I'm going to call the police if you don't, you know, be nice to me or whatever, if you don't let me do this. Um, we know how teenagers can be. You know, this is a huge power you have over your parents and grandparents. And so most people are desperate to try and learn English for their job prospects, for their well-being in their home and family. Um, we have lots of language classes. The, hopefully this spurs an understanding of who's out there, what they need. And we start to fund more of that as well because a lot of those classes are pretty basic. Um, and you know, people who might also interpret might also be able to be paid to teach higher level language skills to people in the community as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I I, I do. Um, I would love to have. Um, um, I guess the secretary of administration maybe join us, and um, <clears throat> and just uh, find out where people are. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. So. Um, it, it strikes me that Burlington as a municipality would be interesting to hear from because they've clearly made choices about this. And the refugee, the director of the refugee resettlement program, mm -hmm. um, which would be, who would be helpful to come and, come and uh, be, uh, testify. So hey. a couple of years, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say Association of Africans Living in Vermont probably has the most robust long-term yeah. education program. USCRI, which was formerly Re Vermont Refugee Resettlement has a growing program. And Winooski and Burlington both have really interesting stories to tell. I mean, Winooski is smaller, so it mirrors more of the rest of the state, I would say. And it has 35% um, in the school's English language learners. So just a really high proportion that, and they've had to learn different lessons. Was that Winooski or Burlington, did you just say? Winooski. That a third. And it has 35%, <coughs> wow. We yeah, had, and the, the Brattleboro High School, this was this was years ago. <clears throat> in the front corridor when you first came up in, they had a, a picture of a tree and all the branches. And at the end of the branches, they had the 
languages that were spoken at home, not not that the kids themselves couldn't speak English, but the that their parents or grandparents couldn't, and so they spoke it at home. And at that time, I think there were about 30 or 35 languages on there. And that was that was little Brattleboro High School. It was, yeah. and some of the languages were, <clears throat> I mean, we think of those languages as um, people who are coming as refugees, but they're, uh, and these, they may be refugees, but they're people who are coming from Poland and Germany and um, mm -hmm. Ukraine and all, all over the world who don't yeah. speak English. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and but uh, often with West people coming from Western <clears throat> countries, they have um, a a common communication language. Whether you know, they, you know, whether they all speak also French or they all also speak um, English or um, Spanish. I mean, they often will speak a language that we do generally translate into. Right. The, or that we already have translations into. Yeah, to be fair, I mean, Winooski calls the students English, the English language learning students multilingual learners, just to remind people they probably speak three other languages. This exactly. Is them. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, thank you. This, this is, thank you, Keisha, for, for introducing this. Thank okay, you. so we will put this on. Um, I think next week is probably pretty full, but we'll put it on the week after that at some point. And then I have a list of people who would love to testify from their okay. family, but we can whenever. Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm.